You are listening to KZT Cornerstone Online Live. My name is Newton Ha. Today's Bible, May 22nd, 2022. This is preached by Pastor Joseph Park. Our reading narration will be all cast through Facebook and YouTube channels. Today's English ministry message, Salvation of Your Wallet. Luke chapter 16, verse 1 to 13. Jesus told this story to his disciples. There was a certain rich man who had a manager handling his affairs. One day, a report came that the manager was wasting his employer's money. So the employer called him in and said, What's this? I hear about you. Get your report in order, because you are going to be fired. The manager thought to himself, Now what? My boss has fired me. I don't have the strength to dig ditches, and I'm too proud to beg. Ah, I know how to ensure that I have, have plenty of friends who will give me a home when I am fired. So he, re, so he invited each person who owed money to his employer to come and discuss the situation. He asked the first one, How much do you owe him? The man replied, I owe him 800 gallons of olive oil. So the manager told him, Take the bill and quickly change it to 400 gallons. And how much do you owe my employer? He asked the next man. I owe him 1,000 bushels of wheat, was the reply. Here, the manager said, take the bell and change it to 800 bushels. The rich man had to admire the dishonest rascal for being so shrewd. And it is true that the children of this world are more shrewd in dealing with the world around them than are the children of the light. Here, Sylvester, use your worldly resources to benefit others and make friends. Then, when your possessions are gone, they will welcome you to an eternal home. If you are faithful in little things, you will be faithful in large ones. But if you are dishonest in little things, you won't be honest with greater responsibilities. And if you are untrustworthy about worldly wealth, who will trust you with the true riches of heaven? And if you are not faithful with other people's things, why should you be trusted with things of your own? No one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other, and you will be devoted to one and despise the other. And you cannot serve God and be enslaved. You are listening to KZT Cornerstone Online Live. My name is Newton Ha. Today's Bible, May 22nd, 2022. This is preached by Pastor Joseph Park. Our reading narration will be all cast through Facebook and YouTube channels. Today's English ministry message, Salvation of Your Wallet. Luke chapter 16, verse 1 to 13. Jesus told this story to his disciples. There was a certain rich man who had a manager handling his affairs. One day, a report came that the manager was wasting his employer's money. So the employer called him in and said, What's this? I hear about you. Get your report in order, because you are going to be fired. The manager thought to himself, Now what? My boss has fired me. I don't have the strength to dig ditches, and I'm too proud to beg. Ah, I know how to ensure that I have, have plenty of friends who will give me a home when I am fired. So he, re, so he invited each person who owed money to his employer to come and discuss the situation. He asked the first one, How much do you owe him? The man replied, I owe him 800 gallons of olive oil. So the manager told him, Take the bill and quickly change it to 400 gallons. And how much do you owe my employer? He asked the next man, I owe him 1,000 bushels of wheat, was the reply. Here, the manager said, Take the bell and change it to 800 bushels. The rich man had to admire the dishonest rascal for being so shrewd, 
And it is true that the children of this world are more shrewd in dealing with the world around them than are the children of the light. Here, Celestine, use your worldly resources to benefit others and make friends. Then, when your possessions are gone, they will welcome you to an eternal home. If you are faithful in little things, you will be faithful in large ones. But if you are dishonest in little things, you won't be honest with greater responsibilities. And if you are untrustworthy about worldly wealth, who will trust you with the true riches of heaven? And if you are not faithful with other people's things, why should you be trusted with things of your own? No one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other, and you will be devoted to one and despise the other. And you cannot serve God and be a slave to money.
Well, today, as we get started, I actually want to spend a, a little extra time in prayer. Um, because I'm talking about Satan tonight. And, uh, and I found something very uh, interesting throughout the years in ministry. That I've only been in ministry you know, 10, 15 years. But every time we talk about Satan, weird things happen. And people get distracted and people kind of lose focus. And I, I've seen all sorts of things happen when I've spoken about Satan or other people have spoken about Satan. I was sitting in the congregation trying to listen. Um, let's face it, most Christians don't live as though Satan was real. Um, I'm willing to bet most of you didn't even think about Satan this week. And that's exactly the way Satan likes it. He wants you to assume like he has no influence in your life. But the truth is, is he's had a tremendous influence in all of our lives. And he's seeking to get into our minds, seeking to get us to think certain things. Those aren't, those aren't coincidences. When certain thoughts and temptations come to our minds or, or run right up into our faces. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, it says... Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking for someone to devour. The Bible says to be self-controlled and alert, recognizing that there's an enemy, recognizing that someone is after you. And I believe most Christians just walk around like they have no enemy, not realizing that someone is trying to destroy your faith. And he would love for you to not pay any attention to this message today and to go on in your life just assuming, oh, Satan, that's just a little fairy tale. Yeah, little red devil. What's he going to do to me? You're foolish if you think that Satan has had no influence in your life because he's after every one of us. He hates the fact that this church is growing. He hates the fact that your relationship with God is growing, that you're growing in your purity. And he's going to throw so much temptation in your face. And his desire, as the Bible says, is to devour you, to keep you from putting your, your total faith in Jesus. And all sorts of things will come into your mind. All sorts of weird opportunities will arise that will keep you from walking how God wants you to. And it's not coincidence. It's all about Satan. And what I'd like you to do right now is I want you to just, I just want to give you a minute to pray for yourself. And seriously, just, just focus. Ask God to allow you to focus today, to hear what you need to hear, and to work on the things you need to work on. So would you just bow your head right now and just pray and really believe in your prayer right now. Father, your word tells us that we have an enemy who tries to get us to fall, tries to devour us. But your word also tells us that you're far stronger than he is, and we thank you for that. And the confidence we can have in you and the trust we can have in you. So God, right now I pray by the power of your spirit that you would keep us attentive and allow us to hear your words. Open it up to us, regardless of what Satan tries to do, Lord. We know you're more powerful. And greater is he who is in us than he who is of the world. We thank you for that, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, in Luke chapter 11, starting in verse 14, we have this story of Jesus casting out a demon from a man. And this has become kind of a common thing in, the, in Jesus' life as he runs across demon-possessed people. But in Luke chapter 11, verse 14, we read the passage. It says, Jesus was driving out a demon that was mute. When the demon left, the man who had been mute spoke, and the crowd was amazed. But some of them said, By Beelzebub, the prince of demons, he is driving out demons. Others tested him by asking for a sign from heaven. Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Any kingdom divided itself will be ruined, against itself will be ruined, and a house divided against itself will fall. If Satan is divided against himself, how can his kingdom stand? I say this because you claim that I drive out demons by Beelzebub. Now, if I drive out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your followers drive them out? So then they will be your judges. 
But if I drive out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come to you. So you've got this situation where the, this demon-possessed man comes up to Jesus, and uh, Jesus casts the demon out. The crowd's amazed, but there are some in the crowd that question him. Some actually say, well, you know how he did it. He used the power of Satan. Beelzebub is, is equivalent to Satan. Um, Beelzebub, uh, it, it, it literally means uh, the, gosh, no, I forgot. It's like the prince or the lord of the house or the lord of the temple. It was, it was uh, this, this evil picture of, uh, of Satan kind of being the ruler of all of these demons. And so what they're saying here, these people who are testing are saying, well, I know how you did that. You used Satan's power to cast out these demons. Now, when you read the account in Matthew, you recognize that the people who questioned him were the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the day. And they're the ones that are accusing Jesus of using the power of Satan to cast out this demon. And Jesus says, are you, are you kidding me? You're, you're telling me I used Satan to cast out one of, I've used his power to cast out one of his demons? And so Satan's house is somehow divided? He goes, you, you know that. You know that if a house is divided, it's not going to stand? And so you're saying that I'm using the power of Satan to battle himself? He goes, it makes no sense. He goes, ask one of your pupils. He goes, even your students would know by what power I cast out the demons. Ask them. He goes, this is by the finger of God. And that means my message is true. Now, it's interesting because you look at that first verse and it says Jesus was driving out a demon that was mute. Okay, it doesn't talk about the man. It says this demon himself was mute. You see, when a, when a person is possessed by a demon, the person takes on the characteristics or the personality of the demon. And so what you have is this mute demon coming into this person and possessing his body, therefore making him mute. And when Jesus casts the demon out, then suddenly the man can, can speak and hear. And the crowd is amazed by this. Now, I know uh, when we talk about demon possession, it's, it's a pretty freaky thing to, to most of us. And, and, and some of you may, may go, well, you know what? Could that just happen to me? Could that ever happen to me? Does that happen today? And, and I, absolutely, it could happen today. Um, but understand something. You don't just become demon possessed. Okay? It's not like you're just living your life doing nothing wrong. First of all, as a believer, you, you can't be demon possessed because you're already possessed by the Holy Spirit. He already owns you. God has you in his hands, John 10 says, and no one can snatch you out of his hands. The Holy Spirit possesses your body. No demon can come in and overpower the Holy Spirit. But secondly, even if you're not a believer today wondering, yeah, can, the whole, you know, can a demon just come into me all of a sudden? You know, everything we understand from Scripture is you have to allow Satan to come into your life. Okay? You have to allow him and invite him into your life. In fact, the houses, you know, that I've been to or the people who have dealt with, you know, whether demons in their homes or whatever else, um, there tends to be some sort of pattern or some sort of past in dealing with Ouija boards or palm reading or, or things like that. And, and suddenly these things escalate, but it all started because they invited Satan in to begin with. And, and, and the issue is, is it doesn't, um, it, it starts so subtly. Okay, like I don't know very many people who are just normal everyday people having nothing to do with Satan, then suddenly one day deciding, I want to be possessed by a demon. And so you just say, you know, come on, demon, come on into me. It, it just doesn't happen that way. It's always the subtle. It's always, you know, you start off with something small. That's what, that's what Satan does. You got to understand, okay, Satan is not an idiot. Okay, the, the, the demons are not foolish. You know, the Bible talks about him being this roaring lion, you know, prowling around, seeking whom he can devour. And, and you picture, you know, if you watch Discovery Channel, you know, one of those cheetahs or, or, or you, know, you know, those lions that just kind of prowl and hide and then they pounce on the antelope or whatever. And it's the whole idea of just, this, just this cunning, sneaking way of getting into their life to devour them. And that's what he does in our lives. He, he appears beautiful. The Bible says, if you have your Bible, in 2 uh, Corinthians, there's a great passage that helps us understand Satan. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Paul's talking about the false teachers back then. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13, he says this. He says, for such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, masquerading as apostles of Christ. 
And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It is not surprising, then, if his servants masquerade as servants of righteousness. Their end will be what their actions deserve. Can you understand that? What the Bible says is, okay, when there are false teachers that come to the church and come to the world, they don't walk in and go, I'm of the devil, listen to me. Okay, no, they will masquerade themselves as angels of light. They will masquerade themselves as followers of Jesus. They'll say, hey, we follow Jesus. Same Jesus you follow and then eventually lead them away. You got to understand that. You see, Satan cleverly gets into people's lives by appearing beautiful. I remember in, I remember in college, you know, you ever just get curious about some of those evil things? I mean, you know, I, I remember being conscious, just being honest with you. I, I was getting ready for ministry and everything else. And, and I always just thought, eh, it'd be kind of cool to go to a seance and just see what it's. I know some of you guys think I'm just wicked, but okay, that, that's just where I was. I just thought, you know, there's just something that's kind of appealing to that. It's like, wow, what really happens? Can I actually see the power in a Ouija board? Does that, does that thing really move? Can I just play with it a little bit? Can I just dabble with it? Or, or just to go to a fortune teller or a palm reader just to see what they say. You know, or sometimes even, you know, growing up, I'd look at the fortune cookies. You know, I don't think that's a bad. But uh, <laughs> it may surprise you. But, uh, you know, just, you know, just everything. Anything just, is there anything questionable? Is there, is there some sort of magic in this or magic in that? Because that seems less, you know, just, just seems harmless. I remember being in college, and this was when I was an intern, you know, for this high school ministry, and, and I used to watch those horror movies. Man, and I know a lot of you guys saw them, so don't go shaking your heads. The Omen, you know, The Exorcist, uh, Amityville Horror, um, Nightmare, oh yeah, see, there you go. See, you guys are <laughs> quoting them now. I mean, and I remember, you know, Poltergeist, remember that one? They're here, you know, and... Uh, <laughs> See, you guys all know it, okay. But I remember, you know, you know, when I'd house sit, you know, we'd turn all the lights, you know, and just, you know, just blare the speakers in total darkness and just watch these horror movies. And, and you know, and that was just such a rush. And there was something that was so intriguing, so appealing. Even when I moved out here, you know, I, I used to work at, at Rocky Peak Church. And, uh, you know, right when I moved down as a, as a college student, I remember them saying, yeah, this is where Manson used to live. And I used to take my Jeep and go back to the places where they said he'd sacrifice things. And, you know, we saw this dead chicken and hang in. It's like, Ooh, you know, and just, you know, find all these rocks and these formations and these little things they'd sacrifice, you know, and, and there was part of it that was like, ooh, you know, it's kind of cool. I want to, I just want to see, I want to see what they do. And there is that part that's so appealing because you think, I'm not going to become some Satan worshiper. I just want to, I just want to see it a little bit. I just want to see what it's like. It's just my curiosity. But then I read, uh, the Bible. <laughs> and uh, Deuteronomy, in Deuteronomy chapter 18. Deuteronomy at chapter 18. It's in the Old Testament. It's fourth book of your Bible. No, fifth book. See, Satan's trying to mess me up. <laughs> Deuteronomy 18, verse 9. It says this. And he's talking about the Israelites, telling them, you know, you know, the Jewish people, when you enter the land, they're not really Israelites yet. But here he goes, when you, verse 9, when you enter the land the Lord your God is giving you, do not learn to imitate the detestable ways of the nations there. Let no one be found among you who sacrifices his son or daughter in the fire, who practices divination or sorcery, interprets omens, engages in witchcraft, or casts spells, or is a medium, or a spiritist, or who consults the dead. Anyone who does these things is detestable to the Lord. And because of these detestable practices, the Lord your God will drive out those nations before you. You must be blameless before the Lord your God. God says very clearly to them, I cannot stand those practices. If anyone is practicing those things, get them out of there. Destroy them. Get them out of that land. I don't want them in that land. I hate that stuff. And you stay away from it. You stay completely pure of that. You must be blameless before the Lord your God. And I remember reading that passage and someone pointing that out to me and going, oh, okay, I better just stay away from it altogether. I mean, God isn't joking around. 
And I can justify and go, well, but I'm not going to go worship Satan. No, he says, you just stay away. You just be totally blameless in that area. Don't dabble in it because I hate it. Look, I'm not, I'm not saying, you know, if you, uh, if you watch Harry Potter that you're going to become some sort of, you know, satanic priest one day. I'm just saying, can you do it and do it to the glory of the Lord? The Bible says, whatever you eat, drink, whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. And I'm just saying, he has a way of making things look beautiful or things looking not so bad. You know, like if I stood up here and I, I just started speaking and saying, you guys... Adultery really isn't that bad. It really isn't, you know? Or you can just sleep with one person your whole life. You know, divorce really isn't that bad. You know, if you find someone you really love more than your spouse, it's, it's all right, God understands. Okay, now if I did that, <laughs> you guys, you know, this is a Bible teaching church, you wouldn't put up with that. Because you wouldn't listen to that type of teaching. But the interesting thing is, if I put music to it and play it on the radio, you'll listen to it. Right? You know, if I, if I make it all beautiful and put it in a movie, you'll pay money to see it. You know, it, it's, it's just saying he makes things beautiful. I could say it and you wouldn't listen to it, but if I put music behind it, oh, because there's beautiful music behind it. You know, it, it's, that's what Satan does. He, he, he disguises himself as light. He makes something appear so beautiful, so harmless, just to get you to dabble. And yeah, maybe you're not going to become possessed by a demon, but it's a victory in Satan's book that he's getting one of God's believers to pay attention to his doctrines and actually love them and actually pay for them, actually get excited about them. You know, um, this, this thing in Deuteronomy where he says he doesn't want anyone to, uh, you know, consult a medium or spiritist or anyone to consult, you know, that just means to seek the dead, to, to try to communicate with the dead. And you guys, this is even something that the world has made into something that is beautiful. You know, you watch movies about, you know, someone, you know, their wife or, you know, their lover passes away and somehow they can communicate. You remember way back when, when Ghost came out and Whoopi Goldberg, and it was just gross. But it, the whole thing of just, you know, just how, you know, he was communicating to her. And, and it was just so beautiful, wasn't it? This love story about him just, you know, never letting go. Or that other one that came out right after that about the fire one. You don't remember that? Fireman guy. Okay. You remember what I'm talking about. Far... What was it? Always. Yeah. And then uh, just recently, we, we were watching one. Uh, butterfly. No, dragonfly. Dragonfly, butterfly, hey, fly, fly. Um, you know, but, you know it's just all these stories about these people in love. And, oh, they're gone, but I can still feel them. I can still talk to them. And they're still communicating to me. And, and it's beautiful, isn't it? I mean, to think that if I lose a loved one, that maybe he came back to just touch me. You know, just to say something to me. And I've heard people who are Christians even say, yeah, I, I still talk to her. I still feel like she speaks to me. You guys, and that sounds it's like, well, come on, it's, it's my grandpa, you know. And, and I'm just talking to him, and yet the, it's, you're seeking the dead. Well, I'm not like worshiping him. I'm just, I'm just talking to him and asking him to pray for me. I'm asking him to look after me. My great-grandma was such a saint that, you know, I, I talked to her and asked her to talk to God for me. And it seems so harmless. I mean, doesn't that seem like a nice thing? No, because you're pursuing those who have passed away. You're seeking after them. And the Bible speaks against that. And you know what it does is it takes away from the, the character of God. Because, you see, I pray to omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent God. I don't need my dad who passed away to pray for me because when I speak to him, he hears me. God can be at all places at all times and he knows every prayer that's in this room and every one of our needs. I don't need another mediator. I've got Jesus. And the idea is we seek after some of these, you know, past loved ones who passed away or, or famous people who passed away. Why? Because we're not being fulfilled by Almighty God. 
It's taking away from his glory when we start to point to all these other people and try to seek these experiences outside of God. God is sufficient. And that's why he says, I don't want you seeking after someone who passed away. The only time we have a, a picture of that is, is when Saul did that with that, that witch you know, in Endor, and he calls up Samuel, and Samuel comes back from the dead and says, what are you doing? You know, why'd you disturb me? What, you know, and, and, and it is Saul in his total wickedness trying to bring someone back. Why? Because the Lord wouldn't answer him because he was in his sin. In the same way, that's why we pursue these things. But my fear is that Satan makes it sound so harmless when God says, I hate that. God wants you to talk to him, not to someone who passed away few years ago, not for you to be so wrapped up in those relationships. He wants to be your number one. And the problem is, is sometimes we want these people from our past back. And God says, I've taken them from you. And it's time to move on and move on in this relationship with me. You know, Satan, Satan is alive and well. You gotta believe this. When you read the accounts of Satan and his fall, let me explain something to you. Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, both are, you know, give us some imagery that show us about the fall of Satan. Satan fell because he wanted to become like God. Uh, um, Isaiah 14, verse 14. Isaiah 14, um, we'll start at verse uh, 13. You know, you got in Isaiah and in Ezekiel, you have these, these things that are addressing uh, Tyre and Babylon, but in the midst of them, it gives, us, it gives us these pictures of this imagery of this anointed cherub, this high cherub who was in the garden, Ezekiel 28 talks about, and his fall right in the middle of the same with Isaiah chapter 14. It gives us some, some ideas of how Satan fell. Verse 13 says, you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of the assembly on the utmost heights of the sacred mountain. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. But you are brought down to the grave, to the depths of the pit. It's this picture of Satan. And, you know, you can read again in Ezekiel 28, Isaiah 14. Read those two passages sometime. Showing you just a little bit of the history of Satan in the midst of these prophecies against Tyre and Babylon. Um, but it, it talks about him wanting to rise up. That's, that's, that's Satan's desire. He wants you to rise up and take the place of God. To believe that you can become God yourself. To believe that you don't have to answer to anyone. There's not this God up there that he has to answer to. And you don't have to answer him either. You do what you believe is right. You do what you feel in your heart. You can become like God. And you think, well, man, that's, that's kind of out there. I mean, of course we can't become like God. And you think, well, maybe there's some, there's some bizarre you know, teachings out there that teach that you can become like God. You know, I want to show you a quote you know, of, of this one, uh, you know, just kind of this weird little sect. You know, this, the, the leader of this, this cult said, I will prove that the world is wrong by showing what God is. God himself was once as we are now and is an exalted man and sits enthroned in yonder heavens. That is the great secret. We have imagined and supposed that God was God from all eternity. I will refute that idea. It's pretty evil, isn't it? Psalm 90 verse 2 says, you know, from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. And this guy's saying, no, I'm going to refute that and show you that God was just like us. He became God. He wasn't eternal. I will refute that idea. You know who said that? Go to the next slide. Joseph Smith, the founder of the Mormon church. Next quote, when our father Adam, Adam was your father, did you know that? Came into the Garden of Eden, he came into it with a celestial body and brought Eve, one of his wives, with him. He helped to make and organize this world. He is Michael, the archangel, the ancient of days, by whom holy men have written and spoken. He is our father and our God and the only God with whom we have to do. You see what's said there? 
Suddenly our father is Adam, who came into the Garden of Eden with one of his wives, Eve, but he's also Michael, the archangel, the Ancient of Days. So suddenly Adam now is our father, the Ancient of Days, and the archangel, Michael, and he's our father and our God and the only God with whom we have to do. See, we read that and we go, well, that's ridiculous. Who would ever believe that? You know who said that? Brigham Young. But they look so good in their white shirts and their hair and, I mean, seriously. Their reputation is better than the reputation of Christians. They're known as the ones who love family. They're the ones that are so beautiful and they have the beautiful temples. Why? What are they trying to teach? That we can become gods. See, God used to be a man. He worked his way there and we can do the same thing. It, it goes against the very core of what we believe, you guys. And yet, what's the world going to say? Come on, leave them alone, Francis. Knock it off. Why are you going to speak against them? Why don't you just leave everyone else alone? Well, because they're destroying the character of God. I'm put on this earth to defend who God is according to his word. Satan is trying to tell the world in all sorts of different shapes and sizes that you can become God. You don't have to answer to him. God wasn't eternal. In fact, they teach that God had a father, and he had a father, and he had a father, and he had a father. It's no different. And I say, it's absolutely different. He is the I am. That means that it wasn't I became, I used to be, I am. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He didn't change and evolve. Yet, yet, yet they'll say, well, but we're Christians too. Bull. You're not. You guys, it goes against... You guys, and I say this, I say that with a broken heart. Because I know of people who, who've wandered away. Why? Because they start with the gospel. Just like Paul said in 2 Corinthians 11, what did he say? He goes, they pose as ambassadors of Christ. We believe in Jesus too. No, you don't. Not my Jesus, who's the same yesterday, today, and forever. You believe in Jesus that was the spirit brother of Satan? That's what they teach. You guys, it's, it's wicked. And I'm not saying that the people in it you know, consciously you're saying we're going to follow the devil, but I'm saying, again, it's one of those ways that Satan is getting to the world, appearing to be beautiful, and people get caught up in it. He masquerades as an angel of light. Why do I say these things? Because as a pastor, I am called to protect my sheep. I'm called to make sure that you don't catch in, you know, find something that just seems so attractive at some point in your life and start moving into it. I'm not here to bash anyone. I'm not here to destroy you know, people or anything like that. I'm, I'm here to warn and, and tell you, you got to know the word of God. You got to know what some of these, these people teach. See, it's all, about, um, it's all about packaging. It's all about something that looks so beautiful. And, and even here, you know, in our passage, and I get back to the passage and wrap up here, but uh, there's a tangent. Um, the Pharisees... The Pharisees here that are against Jesus, I want you to understand something. The Pharisees were not these horrible people. Do you understand who the Pharisees started off being? They had the greatest intentions. The Pharisees, it's literally the separatists. They, they were separating themselves because they were devout Jews who were seeing, they were seeing how the Jewish culture not Jewish, the Greek culture, you know, the Hellenistic culture was influencing Judaism. And so they said, we want to be separate from that. We want to get away from that and purify ourselves from, from the rest of our, our fo the followers of Yahweh who are kind of getting corrupted by it all. Yes, that's a wonderful, wonderful motivation. But what happened over time was suddenly they became self-righteous. And suddenly they became, you know, started making these other laws and higher laws that weren't in the law of Moses, weren't in the law of God. And saying, look, this is how holy we are. Suddenly people were looking up to them and putting them on a pedestal. And that's where they're at now when Jesus comes. It started with a great motive. It looked like a very beautiful thing. But it had become this, this it's almost worship of the Pharisees. They're put so high on a pedestal. That's why they refused to believe in Jesus. 
It wasn't because, you know, like in this situation, when he casts out a demon, everyone's amazed. They go, you did that by Satan's power. They just had to come up with something. They knew it was a miracle, and they knew it couldn't have been done by human ability. So they said, well, you did it out by Satan. That's why you did it. They just refused to believe. The reason why they did not believe in Jesus is because they did not want to believe in Jesus. Not because he, hasn't, he hadn't proven himself. But you see, everyone was flocking to Jesus now, and it was taking away them being on their pedestal and all these followers. Jesus was taking their disciples. And they'd gotten so into this image and persona and this pride that now they couldn't even see the Son of God. And, uh, and Jesus explains, look, I did it by the power of God. Your followers could tell you that. Satan can't cast out demons. The kingdom of God has come. Verse 21, when a strong man, fully armed, guards his house, his possessions are safe. But when someone stronger attacks and overpowers him, he takes away the armor in which the man trusted and divides up the spoils. See, verse 21, he's saying that, that look, if you've got a strong man in a house, he's going to be able to guard his house. Unless someone stronger comes, beats him up, takes all his stuff. And he's saying, that's what's happened in this man. You've got this demon in him. He's a strong man, and no one can cast this demon out. But then suddenly someone stronger comes into the house. He's talking about himself. Jesus, he binds up the strong man, Satan himself, and removes his spoils, which is this demon. He's explaining and, and proclaiming his power. And then in verse 23, he says something very important. He who is not with me is against me. And he who does not gather with me scatters. Very important verse. He's saying, he, this is directly at the Pharisees. He goes, I want you to understand, if you are not for me, you are against me. And another one of Satan's lies is you can be neutral. Well, it's not that I don't believe what you're teaching, Francis. You know, I'm not against it. I'm just not totally for it. It's not that I can just, you know, that I'm against you Christians believing that's the only way. I'm just saying that's just not my way. And Jesus says, well, if you're not with me, you're against me. If you're not gathering with me, you're scattering. Jesus draws a line in the sand and says, look, there's no middle ground. You see, Jesus says, I'm the son of God. I die on the cross. There's, there's no other way to heaven. And you have to make a decision. Everyone has to make a decision. Either you say, no, he's not the only way or he is. And if you're going to go out proclaiming he's not the only way, then you're going against Jesus. You're scattering, pulling people away from God by saying there are many other ways. Jesus says, I'm the only way. And so you just make a decision. You just have to know. I'm not, I'm not forcing you and trying to manipulate you into following Jesus. I would love to see you follow him. I just want you to know that if you don't follow him, you are against him. That's from Jesus' own words. You got to believe something. See, just that most people don't want to say, I don't believe in Jesus. Because something in their heart tells them, don't say that. You know? You don't want to say Jesus was a liar. I've talked to people who say, well, I don't believe he's the son of God. I go, you believe he lied then when he said he was? Well, I'm not saying that. <laughs> Why not? Just say it. Just say it. Stand up and say, Jesus is a liar. It's amazing how many people just refuse to say that, but won't say that he was telling the truth either. What was he doing then? Well, he wasn't telling the truth, he wasn't lying. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> he who is not with me is against me. You got to choose. Everyone's got to choose. Verse 24, very important too. Actually, all the Bible is important. Verse 24. <laughs> When an evil spirit comes out of a man, it goes through arid places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I'll return to the house I left. When it arrives, it finds the house swept clean and put in order. Then it goes and takes seven other spirits more wicked than itself, and they go in and live there. And the final condition of that man is worse than the first. You see what he's saying? He says, Jesus, like he cast this demon out of this man, but this demon will leave the man's body and he'll go cruising around, you know, an arid place like a desert region where there's no other people. So he'll go right back into the person. He says, he'll go right back in. In fact, he'll take seven other demons with him and they'll all jump into the person. What's he trying to say there? He says, if your house is empty, the demon will just come right back in. You better fill it with something. You better fill yourself with the Holy Spirit so the demons can't come in because it's already occupied. 
You see, I hate cats. <laughs> so I'm getting to something. We're talking about Satan cats. They, uh, you know, I just, I just don't like the way that you, you, you don't have to have them leash. You know, they come in my backyard and they, you know, they go all over my backyard and it's just, it's just wrong. Now, <laughs> what I can do is I can each time I see a cat run out there with my BB gun. I mean, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> I don't. I could. I said. But, uh, you know, I could chase them away. Or, you know, I chase away the cats, chase away the cats. But what happens? I'm not going to be back there the whole time chasing them away. But maybe if I occupied my backyard with a pit bull, <laughs> you know, then are the cats going to come back? No, it's the same picture. It's the idea, yeah, I can chase this demon out of you, but if it's empty, you know what? They're all going to come back. But you stick a pit bull in there. You stick the Holy Spirit inside your body. You're being dwelt by God himself, and guess what? No one's coming in. See, that's the picture we have here. And finally, uh, at the end, verse 27, as Jesus was saying these things, a woman in the crowd called out, Blessed is the mother who gave you birth and nursed you. He replied, Blessed, rather, are those who hear the word of God and obey it. Isn't that interesting? Someone screams out, man, your mom must be a blessed woman. I, I wish I was your mom. He goes, no. Blessed are you if you hear the word of God and obey it. Isn't it interesting? Even back then, people were trying to exalt Mary to a place where she didn't belong. And Jesus confronts it and says, no, 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 don't, don't go blessing my mother. Blessed are you if you hear my words and obey it. We've got to stick to the word of God and obey the word of God. Regardless. Man, I know today, you know, and as this, you know, gets on television, I'm offending half the world. Um, but you know what? It's the word of God. And blessed am I if I stick to it and hold on to it. And, you know, the reason why we, we start going in these other directions is... Because we're not holding on to the word of God. The word of God's not filling us up. Our relationship with God isn't filling us up. So I'm going to close one, one last illustration. You know, um, I got a bunch of candy up here. Ever since, um, ever since I've been married, my house has been filled with candy. Um, no, nah, it's just, just my wife. And, you know, I got Reese's, M&M's, whatchamacallit, Twix, Crunch. Got them all. Now... I don't know which one's your favorite. A lot of people like Reese's. Now, the thing about Reese's that is so tempting, I, I just like to, t I, I usually like, I don't know how you eat yours, but I take a bite of mine, like half of it, and then I just like to suck on it for a while. Mm, the best. Now, the thing about candy, I've always got candy in my house. It's always that temptation. You know, I, I blame it on my wife, you know, and she does love it a lot more than I do. <laughs> but it's hard for me to resist. So you know what I do? I gotta what I found is if I will uh, if I will just eat a bunch of healthy food and just just fill myself up with all good food. And I just eat. Now, there's still some temptation, you know, after eating, you know, gorging myself on all this healthy food. There's still some temptation to eat, but, you know, it's so much less, you know? The worst is when you're, you have an empty stomach and all you have is candy laying around. You know? It's like, I gotta eat something. You know, but if you fill yourself up with what is right, what is good, there's less and less room for the other junk. But the problem is, is most people, the problem is, is I can eat in the morning and a few hours later I'm hungry again. You know, I got to eat again. I keep eating. I got to keep eating good stuff so I don't, you know, just run to the candy. See, and that's the problem with most believers we all have an appetite. We all have an appetite for fulfillment, for satisfaction. And if we're not filling ourselves up in the Word of God all week, guess, guess where we're going to run to? The entertainment that Satan has. When we fill ourselves with the Word of God, then suddenly, you know, that starts getting in our mind. That fills us up. And yeah, there's still some temptation to evil, but not so much. Because we're constantly dwelling on it. It's not something where you can just come on the weekends, hear the Word of God, and then starve yourself the rest of the week. 
No, you get hungry and you start desiring your sin. The world sure looks a lot more appealing when, you have, when you don't, you're not filled up with the Spirit. That's why the Bible says, be filled with the Spirit. It, it, it's not a one-time action. But the verb there is talking about be continuously filled with the Holy Spirit. Keep pursuing His Word. Keep getting it in your mind throughout the day. And as you do that, the temptation for the other garbage isn't going to be there. But if you take away what's healthy, you take away the Word of God, and you just get it once a week on the weekends, you're toast. And that's why I just beg you, fill your mind with the Word of God. It's the only way you're going to be able to resist the devil, resist his temptations. You know, as we close today, um, I know some of you are being tempted right now, and it's not a coincidence. There's so much junk in your life and it's just right in your face. Sinful temptations, just right there, right there. Whatever it is for you. And it's not a coincidence. These opportunities that just kind of pop up in front of you, it's not coincidence. These thoughts that go through your mind throughout the day and even at night, they don't just come from nowhere. Satan is trying to get to you. And you you need the power of God. Satan is no match for him. Some of you, it's because the Holy Spirit isn't in your life. You've never really given your life to him. You've been on the fence. You you believed you were neutral. You don't have power to overcome your sin. You don't have power to change. And you keep thinking, well, well, I can't become a Christian because I got all this junk in my life. Well, you're going to have that junk in your life until you're a Christian. So you don't have the power to overcome it without without the Holy Spirit in you. You you may be able to kick one habit, but another one's going to come in until the Holy Spirit comes into your life.